and go live here. I don't know. I seem to always have this click go live thing on uh, Instagram where it, it's telling me to go live, but I'm not able to click the button until I can expand the window out. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's go. Let's get it. Let's go. Let's get it. Let's go. Let's get it. Let's go. Let's get. It. Let's go. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to Fran and Friends podcast on Spotify. We have a great guest this afternoon, um, Abigail McCarroll. She is joining us today and today's topic, we're talking about kids and their big baffling behaviors. So before I get into that, I'm going to just read a little bit of Abby's background, unless you want to share it yourself, Abby, I'm okay with that too. Whatever you prefer, fan, Fran. Okay. Whatever's easier. All right. Um, I will. Yeah, I think I feel like it's better if you do it because it sounds better. <laughs> I'd be glad to fill everybody in on how I got to be where I am today as a therapist. Um, I started in this field over 30 years ago. Um, I'd always enjoyed working with children and. I got paired in a couple of internships, both in California from Michigan, and it was working with really challenging kids back then. But at that time, they were kids, for the most part, that came from trauma, kids who had been removed from their family and had serious challenges with their emotional, social behavior functioning. And so they were placed in either residential treatment or in group homes. And so that's where I cut my teeth for over 25 years is working in the child welfare system. Wow. And uh, after that, I um, took some time off and raised my three daughters and then went back to the field after about 10 years and things had changed so dramatically in the parenting field. I was just floored, blown away. And um, I jumped on really quickly to learn as much as I could about what was going on in the research and parenting and it led me to the um the neuroscience field which you would never guess um had much to do with parenting but it has so much to do with parenting as we'll we'll discover in our conversation so i have been um, in private practice for about five and a half years now working uh, more intensely with um, really complex and challenging children, some of whom may have a history of trauma or coming from hard places like adoption, mm -hmm. the foster care system, but most of them have just been um, children who've crossed my paths that ha path that have been identified as neurodivergent. Okay, so, so I was gonna ask you, because I remember when you first told me what neuro, that you use that word neurodivergent, I'm like, what is that? Yeah. So that's a classification system. It's not actually a, a mental health diagnosis. It encapsulates a variety of challenging children and adults who, who are like they're uniquely wired. They have brains that are not neurotypical. So this could include children and or adults um, who are on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. It could include um, children or adults with learning disabilities or ADHD. They may have um, significant uh, emotional and social challenges. And one of my areas of expertise is actually gifted children who have a extremely uniquely wired brain. It is not neurotypical and parents have a really hard time understanding their children when they are gifted as do teachers. So those are the, um, the children that come across my path. But as, I, as you, we've talked about, I work mostly with parents and a little bit with children because the work I do in helping the parents has a tremendous impact on the child. But I feel like the parents have the the most, uh, um, they're the agents of change in the family. Right, they're um, the influencers, right? They're the influencers. They, they theoretically are more regulated. Right. Um, they definitely have more life experience and for sure they have more resources. I like so, how you said they're theoretically <laughs> more regulated. <laughs> theoretically, not necessarily for sure. Um, so I work really closely with parents and it has a great, from a family systems perspective, it has a great impact on the children as well. 
Um, it's kind of icing on the cake for kids to join the session. Not all, I do all my work online. So it's not always feasible for some of these challenging children to be in front of a, a screen and a camera again, especially after the pandemic, they're just tired of it. But then there are some where it's really effective. So it's a kind of a case by case basis. And we'll do an, uh, like a, a trial run sometimes with kids to see if it's gonna work for them. Uh, okay. Earlier you mentioned the word gifted. Um, like what symptoms could parents identify that would say, oh, maybe my kid is neurodivergent? In the gifted, yeah. yeah. So similarly to children on the spectrum or children with ADHD, gifted children often have what we call overexcitabilities in a variety of areas, um, could have motor excitabilities, social excitabilities. I work mostly with kids who have emotional overexcitabilities. Um, and that's just a, a, a lens through which the gifted world looks at children who are neurodiverse. But regardless of the reason that they're challenging, it is a reflection of de developmental delays in their nervous system that's causing them to not be able to regulate quite so well. Um, but this is, this is new, this is new information for parents. This is not something, um, that I did with my kids even 10 years ago. This is certainly not information that my parents used to raise me. So the, the science is really informing what we're doing with kids. Um, and one of the things that's really important to know, Fran, is that we have moved away in the parenting field completely, a hundred percent away from behavior modification. Really? There is no more rewards or incentives, punishments or consequences. So could you give us a, a little, ins like just kind of a window of what that looked like previously to what you guys are practicing now? Well, yeah, I can do a very good job of telling you because I used it with my kids okay. and sadly with a ton of other people's children too. If I could go back and repair and apologize, for all of the very um, strict and non-effective parenting tools that I've used over the years, I would have, I would, and I have with my own kids. But so in the past, we used timeouts. I mean, that's the biggest one I can talk about. Okay. And um, we thought to, kids need to, you know, get the message that what they did was wrong. And giving them a timeout was an adverse experience. We didn't want, we wanted to pair that. We wanted a punishment. You did this, you're gonna get punished, don't do that. Right. Or yeah, maybe we got a little softer with it and it was like, it's just a consequence. It's, you know, go think about it, right? Go think about the errors of your way and come back and be a different person. It just doesn't work that way. I've um, definitely done that with my kids. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, in all reality, the, um, the timeouts can trigger abandonment trauma. And here we are with a kid whose nervous system is completely off the rails. They're having a rough time. They're scared. They don't know what to do. And then we isolate them. We mm -hmm. we remove ourselves from their presence to deal with it all by themselves, and they don't they don't learn anything. What they what they if they do when they do eventually everyone's nervous system will calm down, right? Even if they're by themselves, but then they start thinking about how angry they are and revenge and getting back at their parents. There's oh. no seeing the errors of their ways. It just doesn't work. Um, so that's a really good example of what we're not doing anymore. And, okay. and also reward systems. I used to have grab bags for my kids when they got home from school because the schools had level systems, right? You got a card pull, you know, a blue card, red card, whatever. And right, or stars, home, right? Mm -hmm, if they came that's home it. with the right things, then they got to pick a little treat out of a bag. And, you know, it never really worked, but I just, I just kept doing it anyway because I didn't know what else to do. Mm. Um, but those kind of rewards, regardless of what they are, disincentivize kids to actually um, be motivated to make the right choices. It, the, the, there is really clear science and studies about this, that um, when you reward children, they don't develop the internal motivation to do well themselves. Like they're constantly um, depending on someone to tell them, good job. You know, I'll give you this if you do that. I'll pay you for grades. Gotcha. You know. And in you, it'll never be enough because the dopamine so the validation, great. right? That's what they're looking for. External validation. Is that what that's creating? Mo external motivation. Oh, okay. Even not just validation, but motivation. Um, and the rewards, I mean, they have, they, they develop tolerance to them. 
And so they have to get bigger and more exciting mm -hmm. and more thrilling and more expensive. Mm -hmm. And so you're on this treadmill that's never really ending. Jeez. So that's how that's how it used to be. But now we we are shifting and really looking at at all of the behaviors that you want to stop, all those things you would have punished or set up reward systems around as not the most important thing. The behavior is a clue. It's information, it's data okay. about what is actually going on inside the nervous system. And we can use the different levels of intense behavior to kind of make assessments about how um, discombobulated the nervous system is, or mm -hmm. in a more scientific term, how much arousal or activation there is in the nervous system to tell us what give us information about what we need to do to to parent the nervous system right to help mm. that child their brain come back online because when when someone's upset and misbehaving it's it's um an indication that they're not doing well as opposed to they're bad they're misbehaving they're maladaptive they're manipulative they're you know um making bad choices uh -uh. at that level of of arousal and dysregulation, their brain is acting very reflexive, reflexively. They're not saying, now I'm going to do this. Now I'm going to do that. It just happens, right? They scream. But they're just yes. responding to like a stimulus uh, of some sort. And then, yeah, hence it's a, that's a great question. What are they responding to? Mm. Right. And the, um, what's, what's so fascinating in the, in the interpersonal neurosciences is a uh, concept called neuroception. Okay. Neuroception. Neuroception. I've never heard that term before. It's, it's not something that most people have heard of. Neuroception is the unconscious process that your nervous system goes through to determine if you're safe or not safe. Oh, is, is, is it the flight or fight, fight or fight response like a blah, the blah, blah, fight blah. or flight response is a reaction if you're not feeling safe it's one reaction it's not all the reactions but in order to um understand like go beneath those behaviors and really understand what's happening in the nervous system we have to understand that neuroception is an unconscious um system that determines safety we call it felt safety felt so it's like safety. emotional safety felt okay. safety got it um, on three levels, on three planes of uh, awareness. One is the internal plane of awareness, which is um, your internal body signals. So there is a, a, sense, a sense that we have called interoception, which is telling us, you know, am I not feeling well? Do I have a headache? Am I hungry? Do I have to use the restroom? Am I tired? Am, am I hurt? Um, all of the the internal um, physiological sensations, like you know, you and I are sitting here, but unconsciously we're shifting. You know, mm -hmm. we might get a little tired of sitting one way, and so we shift to another. It's all yeah, yeah. very, very unconscious until we work to make it not. So, our bot, do we feel safe or not safe on the inside? And then the second plane of awareness that we need to tune into to help us uh, with regulation is the outside, right? the outside of us. And that could include like, it could include things that trigger us. Certain times of day might be hard for us. A certain noise might be hard, post-traumatic stress. We know that that comes from external triggers. It could also be um, sensory sensory sensitivities. Like my, my middle daughter, she just had the hardest time with the ribbing on her socks. Like that was always read as a cue of danger because she had such sensitivities to that feeling on her toes. So we had to come up with all sorts of things to take care of that. But that was an external um, sense of danger to her. Like her, she never like felt comfy in her clothes. Um, it could be also. Um, so sensory can do with feeling uh, sounds and. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there's actually eight senses, Fran. There's sight, sound, um, hearing, touch, and smell. Those are the five you learn in grade school. Okay. But there's also three more. There's interoception, which is that sense our sensation I already talked to you about of sensing the inside. Mm -hmm. There, there is um, the vestibular sense, which is your sense of balance. It mostly sits in your inner ear, so that you don't fall over. Okay. And the eighth sense is proprioceptive sense, which is the experience of your body in space. Like I know how much pressure 
to, I need to pick up my cup of coffee. I know that I don't, if I, if I want to shut a door, I know how much I'm forced to give it so that it doesn't slam. Mm. It is, um, one of the senses that can be um, understimulated or overstimulated. So that's an external thing that you can do in the environment to provide more sensory um, uh, regulation to a person. So, so the uh, back to neuroception, we have the inside, the outside. The outside is also, is your routine structured? Is it predictable? Most of us like to know what comes next. In, in all actuality, um, we've survived as a human species because we have a brain that's predictive in nature. Okay. We look for problems. That's why, that's why it seems like most of our time is spent in, you know, dealing with our problems and troubles and the news and all of that. But we, we had these issues yesterday, right? And we did all this worrying, we did all this stress and we did all this stuff go on to help us feel better. And look at, look at here, we're alive again today. Right. So everything that we did to pay attention to those troubles must have been a good thing because we're alive. It's all unconscious, but when we don't know what's coming next, it feels very unsafe. Mm -hmm. So for kids in particular and kids who are, who are neurodivergent, they need good structure. They need predictability. They need routine. Um, and then you titrate in modifications or changes or what you call a wild card to have them have a little bit of stress with things not going their way. So they can grow their window of tolerance for stress or changes, but not a ton. If it's way too far out their window of tolerance, you're going to get a big experience, a big activation and arousal in their nervous system. Anyway, I'm going to pull this back. You have a question? No, 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 no. I was no, I was thinking like, oh, okay. So when when kids have, I guess um, you were mentioning like they they have. There's only so much that they can take. Is that what I'm hearing? If they're in that, if they have that kind of, um, I guess, re normal reaction to um, whatever, whatever the triggers are. Mm -hmm. So as parents, like what can they do if they do find themselves in that kind of situation? And this is their first time, like identifying, oh, my kid is neurodivergent. I see these are mm -hmm. some of the symptoms that they have at that particular time and point for somebody that's just joining on the live. And they're like, oh, could you help me give me some tips on that? Um, absolutely. There's, there's so many different things that you can do. Um, let me just, if I might just finish with the third plane of sure. interoception yeah, yeah. and then we can talk about things you, you can do on the inside, the outside and the in between to help that child feel better regulated. But when we're looking at, at challenging or complex behavior that we don't understand, it's also important to know that not only are you assessing danger on the inside of your body, in your environment, but you're also assessing um, safety and danger, that sense of felt safety in your relationships. Mm. So here's another point. Remember, this is all happening unconsciously, right? So now we, with every person that you either that's in the room with you or you bring to mind, it's like, how is how have I, that person reacted to me in the past, right? Or is that someone I feel safe with? Do right. they do they know me? Do they understand me? Do they get me? Do they hear me, see me? Do they accept me for who I am even at my hardest times? Will they be there for me? Mm. Will they leave me? So when you can answer, you know, the, the right way for all those questions, so yes, you know, they're going to be there for you, then that feels safe in the relationship. So you're balancing in your nervous system these three planes all the time. And then to complicate it just a little bit more, it's like all of this is happening what we call the river of the present. Every unfolding moment, your brain processes 80 million bits of information. That's About 30 to 60% are pieces of information you have conscious access to. So the rest is humming in the background, right? Wow. Now we need to bring in the past. So the river of the present meets everything that's ever happened to you to meet the river of, the, so the river of the past meets the river of the present to, to um, help you feel safe or not safe. So if you've had really traumatic things happen to you, if you have a history of abuse in your family or in your life, those things are going to also um, work to determine whether or not you feel safe or not safe. And also in, in primarily in assessing your triggers. So all this comes together and it's really quite amazing that we ever 
function at all. <laughs> There's so much going on behind the scenes. Our brains are so complex. It kind of sounds um, like a computer. It is a computer. It is. Yeah. And so get, let's get back to your, your question about what do we do about it? The very first thing that I do when I work with parents and families is to work on parent self-regulation. Mm -hmm. That if you do nothing else, that is the number one um, goal, the number one um, experience that parents can do to calm things down in their home. Because the parent relationship is so important. Kids are so dependent on their parents. And they need to know that their parents are not scary. Mm. They need to know that their parents um, won't hurt them or won't abandon them or won't be mean to them. So that's a, that's a heavy lift, right? Especially yeah. with the way we were parented, like that's what we did. That's parents who did those mean, scary, big things, right? We're moved yeah. away completely from that. It, you still get to be human. It's still going to happen, but we want it to happen less and less, right? Mm -hmm. We want there to be longer periods of time before you flip your lid and, and, and come across as scary. Um, so the, the, there are many things that parent, I work with parents to do. I have a, have a strategy. A lot of my work has come from my mentor, Robin Goble, and I'll just put a, um, a note in to check out her website, Robin, R-O-B-Y-N, G-O-B-B-E-L.com. She's got a great podcast called, um, uh, Big Baffling Behaviors. Oh, <laughs> That's funny that I named this as I didn't even. <laughs> yes, yes. It just tells you where so much of my work comes from. Gotcha. She is she is the guru of all of this. Okay. Um, but in the heat of the moment, she teaches folks, and I use this with my parents to um, do something called the four steps to grounding, which is this is for when you're you're flipping your lid. This is for okay. the hardest times. This is a strategy to calm your nervous system when you need it. All right. So. The first step is to first notice that you're not doing well. Those now, now we're going to go back to interoception, right? Mm -hmm. So as you build your awareness of your uh, interoception of your neuroception, the better you are at paying attention to what's going on with you. It's the ability, it's the ability to observe yourself so while you're, while you are functioning. Mm. Another word, another word for it is metacognition. So you can observe your own thoughts. It's like you're thinking about thinking like, I just I just noticed I said some really mean things to myself. Hmm, I wonder what's going on with that while you're doing it. it it's really hard, Fran. It's, it's one of the, the goals that I work with with families and kids for a very long time. It's hard for therapists to do, but to be present minded of what is going on with you while it's happening. So if you want to, you can change it because you can't change anything that you don't notice, right? Right, right. So the first step in these four steps to grounding is to notice that you're not doing well. You're getting activated. There's more energy. There's more arousal. You might be saying things, looks on your face, pacing. Like, what am I doing? I'm pacing. Like, what is my face doing? It's making a mean face. You know, like bring you it to your awareness. sense of anxiety. Yeah. Your heart could be beating fast. Mm -hmm. you're, you're taking quicker breaths. You're taking shallow breaths. You could be making fists, tension in the shoulders. You got to really tune in to noticing these things. So we work on that. That's not like just notice it and you can do it, right? Right. So the first step is to notice. And the second step is to acknowledge that it's happening. Acknowledge that you're flipping your lid. Acknowledge that you're getting activated um, without judgment. Mm. With hard to do. It is hard to do because, um, it, and, and also to acknowledge it and don't try and talk yourself out of the fact or ignore that you're actually getting upset. So just oh. let the feeling, uh, allow the expression to have its way in your body. Is that what you're saying? Like at mm, that moment? You don't really, you don't have much control or, over how it's expressed in your body. It's just going to happen, okay. but it happens differently for different people. But the first step is to notice that it's happening. And the second step is to not um, be self-critical about it, not and try, not try and talk yourself out of it so you can do something about it. Because some people can say, I'm not really, I'm not really upset. I'm not really upset. And they, they. <laughs> but the expression like is all over their face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they don't regulate. That's like, that's even scarier for kids because it's, in, it's inauthentic. Like they know you're upset and you're saying you're not upset. It's like. 
are you, when are you going to pounce? Right. (laughs) (laughs) So you gotta, you gotta notice you're getting upset. You gotta acknowledge that it's real and not try and talk yourself out of it. But then I, the third stop is the golden stop. It is to shower yourself with Mm self-compassion. This is like, um, Robin talks about two things being the crux of all treatment. One is safety in the nervous system, felt safety, and the other is compassion. So if you forget everything we talked about today, Fran, when you're with other people, because this is the neurobiology of being human, not necessarily of just working with kids, remember safety is the treatment and compassion is the treatment for yourself and for others. You can remember those two things. Okay. So self-compassion, you know, people say really, really harsh things to themselves, life, society, parents, siblings, teachers, we all sadly develop this really harsh inner critic. So at that moment of great suffering, when you've noticed and you've acknowledged it, you say kind things to yourself. Mm. Like this is, are you familiar with Kristen Neff's work? She's Mm. the self, oh, you should write her, Kristen, Kristen, Kristen Neff. She has so many free resources on her website. She's the guru of self-compassion. Okay. And so Is she'll K R I S T I N. Uh huh. No. Okay. N E F F. Okay. Cool. Got it. I um sh- shower yourself with the kindest statements ever. This is a moment of suffering. I'm having a hard time. I'm doing the best that I can. I'm only human. When you start to say those things to yourself. Instead of, oh my God, you're doing it again. You're such an idiot. I can't believe you're the worst parent in the world. You failed again. Um, mm-hmm. Just see the difference about how that regulates your nervous system, right? Okay, this is hard. I, I'm i going to try my best. I am I am the best parent I possibly can be. I'm, tr- I'm doing the best that I can. Those statements mm-hmm. are down-regulating to that activation and arousal in the nervous system. I was... I was thinking about those words as you were saying it. It's like, oh, after we notice it and then we become more aware of what we're doing. Acknowledge is number two. Acknowledge. We're we're acknowledging it. I was like, oh, okay. So just because we're seeing and we're feeling the movements in our body of what that feels like to be tense or anxious or whatever it is that we're feeling at that moment, I feel like as we are doing that and releasing those words of compassion that like you were saying, it, it's self. It, it's helping us to, I guess, deregulate. Is that the right word? Yeah, just um, down. I call it downregulate down or just, just regulate. Yeah, yeah. Because the energy it's, it's giving us a, uh, an opportunity to to let, even though we don't want to say like bad things, it it's just allowing us to have the expression, the expression to have its space. Yes, yes, and and you can say it out loud. You can say it to yourself. It's not a bad thing for thing for kids to hear. You're modeling for them what you do and when you're having a hard time, right? Is that you're still kind to yourself? You don't beat yourself up. You're not, and you're not trying to beat them up either. Yeah. Um, but in all honesty, it's the hardest of the four steps. There's one more step, but this is the one that parents have the hardest time with. There's uh, something that my emotion coach taught me. His name is J. Chanth Lanksy, and he does a lot of work in uh, Dr. Bradley Nelson's book called Emotional and the emotion code where um, he uses this thing called spa and it's S stands for self P stands for praise and A stands for affirmation. (laughs) It's like have yourself a spa. (laughs) Well, yes, that's the self-compassion piece. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that requires a lot of debriefing with me and parents to help them remember to do that. And then the fourth step, is to release the tension. Oof. You release the tension, and there's many, many ways to do that. Okay. The most simply is with a deep abdominal breath in through your nose and slowly out, slowly. It's that slow exhale that is the regulating piece. It, mm-hmm. it invites the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest system to come into play. Because when we're we're activated, we're we're doing a lot of chest breathing really quickly. And that's arousing. If we need to run or fight, we need that energy. But if we're trying to calm down, we need a slow, slow exhale to give our our neuroception a clue of safety that we're really okay. There's really unless there is, 
physical danger in an argument with your kid. There could be. And then your fight or flight, your, your natural instincts will kick in. But if not, you don't want to mouth off. You don't want to add fuel to the fire. So you're right. gonna, taking a breath is the easiest thing to do, but you could do some shoulder rolls. You know, you could open and close your fists. Mm -hmm. um, anything movement wise, walking around, you put your hands on your heart and take a deep mm -hmm. breath. I often say one for me um, and then I breathe again. One for you. And I, see how see how different you feel? I feel great. I feel so restful now. I'm not even going through this stage, but I'm just saying. Yeah. So that's my that's you know, I learned that from Robin, that four steps to grounding in the heat of the moment. And don't expect yourself to be able to do it. Mm. Okay. I have some visual prompts that I send parents, but the only way that it becomes wired into your brain to do that, like driving is wired in and automatic is when you practice debriefing afterwards and you go through the four steps. Did I notice? When did I notice? Mm -hmm. Did I acknowledge it? Did I try and talk myself out of it? Did I say those statements of self-compassion? No. Well, let me say them now. So we do now what was needed then. And then it, did I, did I do a breath? Maybe a little bit, but you practice it afterwards. So the, it's like rehearsal, right? Like any, any new skill, the wiring, the dendrites, the connections in the brain become stronger and the pathways become deeper, the more you practice it. So when you can, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to debrief everything, but when you can to go back and relive those work through those four steps to grounding. That's how you learn it. So you want it to be automatic in the heat of the moment. You don't want to have to pause and go, oh, what's next on the list? Mm. And, you, know, <laughs> you will at the beginning. And maybe you need to walk over to the fridge sheet and see, look at the four steps and see what comes next. And look at what you wrote down for your self-compassion statements. I just have it printed around the house, right? I, very, I, send, I do. I, I send like four or five copies to families to put up in different places. Yeah. Because it makes sense. It reminds us to, okay, oh, okay. yeah, I need to, this is the area that I really want to work on. I mean, because why else would they come to see you, right? Right. Most people come because they have trouble regulating. Bad things happen to a lot of people, but it's the ones who are having trouble with their emotions that typically seek out therapy. Yeah. So I really like how um, the name of our, our topic today is Big Baffling Behaviors. Mm -hmm. And or kids' big baffling behaviors, but it's really about parents. Mm -hmm. And for parents, go, please go ahead, Mary. Yeah, it is. It is. If we have to start with the parents, and the things that I teach parents, I invite them to bring to their kids, even if the kids aren't in there in the session. When the kids do come to the session, um, we're able to learn some of the things together. Um, and I. Um, do something called primitive reflex integration, what? which is, <laughs> no. I'm going to say it again slower, primitive <laughs> reflex integration. Okay. <laughs> it is a strategy. It's, it's a area of practice that helps with regulation. It helps to what I call grow the owl brain, right? We the want owl the owl brain, the thinking brain, right? Because okay. we want to stay there as much as possible. And a lot of times with neurodivergent, children and adults, their owl brain is underdeveloped. They have a lot of pathways in their feeling brain and their, in their amygdala, I call the watchdog brain, and some in the possum brain, which is the shutdown or dissociative response. But the primitive reflex integration work is uh, primarily movement-based, right? So the body and, and your mind learns best with movement. Movement was our first language growing up. We, we did a lot of movement to communicate when we were infants. And primitive reflex integration is um, an area of practice that comes primarily from occupational therapy. Mm. You won't find it much in the mental health field. It's very, very much in the periphery. In the 30 plus years I've been in this field, I've only heard it mentioned a couple of times. I can't believe that because it's so important. But let me explain primitive reflexes first. Okay. So primitive reflexes are those reflexes that we're born with. When you are born, um, that first breath that you take is a reflex. Um, the instinct to, to nurse um, and root are both reflexes. Creeping is a reflex. That's that army crawl that babies do before they can push up on their hands and knees is a reflex. 
crawling is a reflex, walking is a reflex, and there's many more. So but these are like natural stages that are like innately our body already knows to do those things. They're wired in. They're wired into the brain stem. You don't have to think about them. They're way deep in the most primitive area of the brain. Gotcha. They're they're instincts. They're primitive reflexes. And then when you're born, over the course of that first year, we're, we have certain experiences. We're, we have certain stimulations and learnings and, and relationships that help us um, gain more conscious control over our movements, right? So we can decide if we're hungry and want to eat. You know, mm -hmm. something brushes our cheek. We may not have that rooting response because we're not hungry or, um, we see something across the room and um, we can get up and go get it as opposed to relying on scooching across the floor. We have the conscious control over that. But for a ton of reasons, Fran, those reflexes might not become integrated into higher level functions. They stay active. Yeah. Um, it could be that there was something going on in the interuterine environment. It could have been drug exposure or something like that that made you more vulnerable to hang on to those reflexes. Oh. It could have been something in the birthing process. Some of the reflexes get integrated through a vaginal birth. So if you've had a C-section, there are some reflexes that won't actually get integrated. Really? If yeah. If you're adopted, like if you're snatched away from the woman who carried you for nine months and all of a sudden everything else is different, you don't hear the same voice, you don't have the same, you know, um, closeness that you did with that with that birth parent, that could be something that makes it harder to, to integrate those reflexes. It could be trauma. I would have never thought that, that, that there will be a disconnection like as the child sitting in the womb, listening to this mother's voice. I oh, never yeah. knew that that i don't know who's calling me and i should have put my phone on silent my apologies um i i i never thought that the what do you call it? the trimesters where we're inside of our mother's womb listening to her voice to what she's feeling that you know if there was a separation like you mentioned about adoption that there that there's also a disconnection mm -hmm. it's a it's a Wow. It's when you go back to, to neuroception and felt safety, it's read as danger. Like my caregiver isn't here. Where's that voice? Wow. Where's the rhythm that that person walked with? You know, everyone has their own rhythm. So that's already with. trauma, huh? Oh yeah. Oh gosh. And then wow. it, it, yeah. Like I said too, it could be, it could be actual abuse or neglect, mm -hmm. very traumatizing to the nervous system. It could be a brain that's wired differently. Like I talked about ADHD, autism, yeah. or giftedness. Yes. Those are all predispositions to having um, active reflexes. And, I, and I've, this is not scientific, but I've noticed in my practice with the gifted kids that they blow through their development milestones much quicker. So they don't have as much time on the floor to tell, doing tummy time or creeping or crawling. Like they see that person walking and they like figure it out. And so they miss out on so many important movements that integrate those reflexes. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do, what I do is I, with parents, if it's, I'm working with parents and or with kids, if the kids are involved, if not, the parents take these movements and teach them to the kids. We get back down on the floor and we cre recreate the movements from the first year of life. I and remember you sharing this with me. Mm -hmm, in a very slow and methodical way so that the brain can grow connections where it's weak. So, so like in, we're actually getting on the floor and we're crawling and we're moving in these movements? Yes, but slowly. Okay. Very slowly. And um, the as you now with anything, right, it requires you to practice it. You're not going to wire up your pawns, which is where the fear paralysis reflex sits. You're not going to wire that up for less anxiety if you don't do the movement. And the main movement for integrating the, the fear paralysis reflex, which is something that ang people who are anxious often struggle with, um, is creeping. So you're back on the ground. And it's very different to creep as an adult or an older child than it was as a baby, right? So is creeping sim similar to crawling? Creeping is when you're on your tummy, you know how babies scooch and like that army crawl uh -huh. before they, yeah, before they can push up, they're not strong enough to crawl yet, Yes, but they want that. It's, it's, it's on your tummy. So we find a slick surface in the home and all, all the family members, it's 
just imagine everybody doing the creeping. It's really fun. That would be so fun. <laughs> yeah, and we, I, I come up with games and, and ways to make it playful with parents because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a brain exercise. Not everybody's going to want to do it. It's, it's not always the easiest style, especially for teenage boys, but it's not impossible. And the purpose is to help us with our primitive reflexes. Yes. And as those reflexes get integrated, things become easier. They're not quite as triggered. They're not quite as afraid of things. Um, and so once the, the fear paralysis reflex is integrated, which sits in the pons, which is really low in the brainstem or low in the brain, near the brainstem, we move up to the midbrain, which is where the moral reflex, the fight or flight reflex sits mm -hmm. in the amygdala. And the main movement that integrates the um, fight or flight response in the amygdala is crawling very slowly and very methodically. And yes, I have knee pads because again, our adult bodies are very different than when we were babies. Um, but it's, if you think about it, right brain, left brain, looking up, looking down, it's such an important organizing movement to integrate the right and left hemisphere and to, to um, specialize the different areas of the brain. I never even thought about that. So we're going to wrap up um, okay. this, this section, but I wanted you to reiterate to the two of the um, things that you mentioned that, uh, you know, that were tips for the parents, um, the four uh, stages that they go through if they find themselves in a heightened state mm -hmm. with their children, and then also too about the crawling. Yeah. <laughs> Or so, creep, creeping, right? Creeping. Mm -hmm. So the four steps to grounding are in the heat of the moment. So you're going to notice when you're starting to become agitated, upset, dysregulated. You're going to acknowledge that it's happening. That essentially means you're not going to ignore it. You're not going to talk yourself out of it. Okay. So notice and acknowledge. And then three, the hardest one for parents to remember is statements of self-compassion. Yeah. Yes, Absolutely. Okay. Give yourself a hug. Give yourself and a then, spa. <laughs> yeah, ah, yeah, I'm going to use that. Self-paced affirmation. <laughs> I will. And then the fourth step is to release the tension with either breath or movement. Yes. And the movement can be creeping. Ah, I was going to um, mention the breathing that, that you taught us with yeah. putting our hands slow on your heart. Exhale, your hands on your heart mm -hmm. in through your nose. And a slow exhale. I like to make the shape of a straw makes it go out slower. Okay. And then all of that um, helps with regulation. It helps to grow the owl brain in the heat of the moment. And then outside of the heat of the moment, there's a ton of things that I teach parents, one of which is permitted reflex integration. So yeah, if you are having a hard time and you just drop to the floor and start doing creeping, that's going to regulate your nervous system. And it's also going to, the kid's going to look at you and go, what are you doing? Probably <laughs> join you. <laughs> I'm out and like they're no longer mad because they're thinking you're so weird. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I'm gonna have people. Um, I'm gonna have you drop your information in a few moments, but I'm gonna okay. do a round robin session. Yeah. And then also, if there's anybody watching on social media and you have any questions about maybe some things that you're experiencing with your children that you want to ask Abby, she is available for you uh, to ask that question too. So please drop your questions in the chat. But before we do that, I'm going to, I asked Abby three questions before we hopped on here. And her first question was, um, what makes you passionate and gets you motivated? Hmm. Um, I, I, it won't be a surprise, but pa parents get me <laughs> passionate, passionate and get me motivated. I would say for myself, that's my most cherished role has to be, has, has, um, the role of parent in my life. And I didn't do things in the best way. I thought I was, I thought I did. I just, I caused a lot of damage in my own kids. And so my passion, my passion now is to bring this information to as many people as possible, as many parents as possible to save their family from the trauma that I put mine through. Abby, this is such an important work that you're doing because it's, you allow the parents to have an opportunity to recreate the influence that they have in their homes. Mm -hmm. Like kids can now walk away with more tools and resources than they did with the version of their parents they currently have. 
And now they can feel more, I, I guess, I'm not sure if the right word is self-regulated, but they can go into the world with a little bit more balance than they did previously. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, we had, there's so much more we could talk about, Fran, but, you know, more, they go out more circular, more securely attached. Mm, yeah, yes, more secure, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and our second question is, what's your best advice for entrepreneurs or someone getting into your field? Well, so I'm a licensed clinical social worker. So you have to go to graduate school. <laughs> and then you got to work a couple of years under someone else's license. And then you have to take a big licensing exam. And then you can hang a shingle. Ooh. So honestly, it is do well in your academics. Um, find one of the fields that will allow you to work independently. Go to graduate school, get that degree. Um, work for the two to three years that you need to supervise so you can sit through your licensing exam and just never give up, right? We, I got to tell you, Fran, especially with the, through the pandemic, there's a shortage of mental health workers out there right now. Wow. There's not enough of us to go around like doctors and nurses after mm -hmm. the pandemic. We need you. So please, please, please. See, Abby's telling you guys, if you are thinking about going into uh, clinical social work, She's asking you guys to hop aboard because they need your help. <laughs> All right. So our third question is, how do you define success in your field? Um, that's a good question. In my field, I think for me, it's every day that I sit at my computer and meet with parents and it, in, a, in, in that moment that we're together, if I can offer them the co-regulation that they need, if I can give them the support, help them feel seen, safe, soothed, and secure, mm -hmm. it buys them a little bit more nervous system regulation so they can go back out and do it again with these really, really challenging kiddos. Mm -hmm. So, you know, honestly, I, my success is that they come to therapy, that they're with me, right? And they keep coming back and get you know, whatever it is that they're getting out of being with me. Um, they, they start to internalize my words, internalize my, my calm and my presence so that when they turn to their kids, I often will have parents say, I heard your voice in my head <laughs> and, and the other thing. And I'm like, okay, then, it, then that's the sweet sauce right there. When they, when they, when they hear me, that's for me when, I don't know if in my, in my field, if for that's for everybody, but that's, that's, success for me for sure. So when the parents do come to you, how long do they have? Like, uh, I don't know if there's like a time frame for them to learn these skills that you're teaching them. Mm -hmm. uh, that is such a good question, Fran. Everybody asks that. And I do a free hour long intake consultation call. Oh, okay. I do because um, I, it's really important to me that it's a good fit between me and my clients. And the answer is always, it depends Okay. on so many different things. I have this loosely defined program that I work people through, but it's only going to be as effective as those parents going out and doing the work in between. I, I, I'm pretty structured. I give homework assignments, but you could come and pay me every week from now until the end of time and nothing will change if you don't do anything in between. So some parents are like, they just take it and run with it, right? They do the work, they absorb it, they do the practice. And, you know, maybe between six and nine months, they feel confident and they got what they, they got what they were looking for and can move on. I have some families that just come for years because like I said earlier, they come back and they get what they need from me so mm -hmm. that they can go out and be with these really tough kids again. So it depends on your needs, honestly. Do you find that the parents that, um, that take the shortest amount of time are the ones that are more self-aware of themselves versus the parents that are the ones that take longer? You know, in all honesty, I can't really answer that question because interspersed with um, the learning that they're doing is a variable I can't predict or have control over and it's finances. Uh, okay. And, and ske schedules. The families that I work with are going in a million different directions with work, school, activities, sports. And so, you know, it just may no longer fit for them to be able to come. So between that, between finances changing and them getting enough to be able to do it themselves, I can't really, I can't, 
accurately assess how long all of that will take okay. or how that impacts, how all that impacts, how long it will take. Okay. I'm going to check the social medias to see if there's some questions. Sure. For us. Thank you for sharing that with us. Let me see. I don't see anything on LinkedIn. No questions here. I know. I, I thought like if I had StreamYard, they're all supposed to come in one place, but I don't see it. <laughs> so I don't see anybody on Instagram asking questions. I don't see anybody on LinkedIn. And then I know that there was, is there Facebook too? Yeah. Facebook. And I don't see anybody on there either. Well, Abby, tell people where to find you and that way they can, you know, knock your door down because I, you are needed. You're needed for our homes. You are needed so that we can change the conversations that we have at home, especially for parents that have come from a uh, background with trauma. Just, mm -hmm. uh, just I think just for ourselves, even if we're not a parent, I think these tools that you're helping us with, they, mm -hmm. they would help us be, like you said earlier, become more secure mm -hmm. and how we show up in the spaces that we occupy. Absolutely. And I do work with individual adults and some older teens with using the same, you know, theories and, and um, approaches. Um, and it has impact because it's the neurobiology being human, which has implications in your relationships at work and community. Um, so I, just so you know, I do work with individuals as well. Cool. But you can find me. The, the easiest thing to do is just go to my website super all my inf all my contact information is there my phone number my um email and it's welcome home family therapy it's right there at the bottom all right you guys heard her welcome home family family therapy.com or is it dot dot com. Org? Dot it's com. dot com okay well everybody thank you so much for joining us abigail i really enjoyed our conversation and just mm -hmm. the tips and tools that you left us because we don't know who this might reach in social media mm -hmm as this may have been a tool that they need and they may not be able to afford that at the moment. Yeah. But for those of you that can, Abby's waiting for you. <laughs> Thank you. Right. It was a pleasure being with you. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. All right, if you can hold on for just a, a minute. Sure. Abby. Okay, cool.